Once again, everyone, please find your seats. Silence your cell phones at this time. No food beverage allowed in the chambers. We are about to begin. Thank you very much. All right, good afternoon. I am New York City Council Member Donovan Richards of the 31st District in Queens and the Chair of the Committee on Public Safety. Thank you for joining us today. I want to first acknowledge the members of the Public Safety Committee who are here, uh, Queens Council Member Rory Lansman, uh, Brooklyn being represented by Council Member Chaim Deutsch. We are here to discuss a topic that I wish we did not have to address in New York City of all places. We New Yorkers are proud of a lot of things but our diversity has to be at the top of that list. In my own district in Far Rockaway, we are black Americans of mixed, mixed ethnicities. We are white, we are 25% Latino. We have a strong Hasidic Jewish community, all of us living together, sharing the subways, buses, restaurants, and elected officials. And to most, if not all of us, a life shared amongst different cultures and different ways of life is what makes New York the greatest city in the world. There have been times, of course, in our shared history when there has been tension. I remember when I was growing up, the Crown Heights riots and the tension between the black community and the Jewish community that arose out of a tragic accident that pitted these communities against each other. Eventually, what brought us out of that time was the recognition that it is hard work to live together, but work that has to be done. Two vastly different cultures will, of course, take time to learn and understand each other. That kind of tension, even if I don't like it, I can understand that it is part of growing up as a society. But what is harder to understand is the animus that we are seeing more and more today not based on the challenges of living together, but based on the belief that someone else is less of a person, less deserving of life because of what they look like or what they believe or whom they love. That is simply anger and rage and a need to oppress. And it makes me sick that in the United States of America in 2018, there are people out there who still think they need to hate someone else, to kill someone else for their differences. That's something I will never truly understand. Given how inconceivable that kind of hatred is, it is tempting to want to punish and silence anyone who expresses these hateful ideologies. In my gut, I feel that way. When the groups like the Proud Boys come to our city to spew their wrongheaded nonsense, it's easy for me to lose sight of what it means to live in a free democratic society. When the President of the United States refuses to condemn white nationalism, I am ashamed of who we are, and I am angry that progress has been so slow. It is in those moments that we need to rise above our own anger and remember that as horrendous and wrong as we know white nationalism, anti-Semitism, racism of any kind to be, the freedom of our nation depends on the protection of their First Amendment right to say what they believe. Our ability to rise above them, to defend their rights even when they attack us. That is ultimately what makes us better than them. They are wrong to hate us for differences we are born with or are, or or are given to us by God. And we are righteous because we cherish and defend their choice to say that which we know to be false and wrong. But what we will not do is tolerate crimes committed against those who have been marginalized and persecuted throughout history. Decades ago, there were tension between the black and Jewish communities, but today they continue to be unified by the inevitable distinction toward the top of the list of hate crime victims. Today and always, we must remember that what happened at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh 
is what happened at the church in South Carolina. Here in New York, our law says that a crime committed in the name of racial or religious or homophobic hatred will be punished severely. Our houses of worship are sacred and they must be kept safe, not with more guns and more violence, but with laws. Today, we will hear from the NYPD about the Hate Crimes Task Force, whose officers have the difficult job of knowing when to protect those who wish to speak and stopping those who wish to commit crimes. I know there are challenges in that role, and I know there is more we can do to support their efforts. For that reason, we are also hearing two related bills, Intro 1234, sponsored by Councilmember Levine, which would require the mayor to establish an office for the prevention of hate crimes to coordinate a response to hate crimes among city agencies. And Councilmember Deutsch and I are co-sponsoring a pre-considered introduction to require the, that office to conduct education outreach to the community. The NYPD has a huge role to, keep, to play in keeping us safe. But as a society, we can't just rely on the police to change minds and hearts. This is something we are going to have to all do coming together. That being said, I'm going to turn uh, uh, Mike over to uh, Councilmember Deutsch, who is the lead sponsor on. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Richards. Um, good afternoon. Uh, during the last several weeks, it seems that there is a new hate crime reported nearly every day uh, in the news. In fact, there have been a total of 313 reported hate crimes in New York City this year to date. That's nearly one a day in 2018. In the United States at large, hate crimes are on the rise as well. The most recent numbers from the FBI indicate a 17% increase in reported hate crimes as these numbers rise for the third year in a row. My bill would require an educational arm for the Office of Hate Crime Prevention that would require outreach through coordination with, with relevant city agencies, the NYPD, interfaith organizations, community groups, and others to conduct effective education about the impact and effects of hate crimes, and work with the Department of Education to create a curriculum that addresses issues relating to hate crimes and teaches tolerance and understanding. In an effort to be transparent, my bill will also require public postings on the New York City website about the populations reached by the Division of Educational Outreach. Two, the types of programs created or provided by the Division of Educational Outreach and the names of the providers of such programs. And three, any, out, any, any other outreach, education, and prevention efforts made by the Division of, edu, of Educational Outreach. Our city is a melting pot home to New Yorkers from 150 different countries who speak more than 80 different languages, and 40% of New Yorkers are immigrants. Mutual respect and un an understanding of people with different ethnicities, religions, and belief systems can go a long way towards creating a more peaceful, tolerant New York City. Over the last several weeks, um, followed the incidents in Pittsburgh, where 11 individuals were murdered, were slaughtered, just only praying at a synagogue. Uh, since then, we have experienced also here in New York City with the African burial, where there was racial slurs scrawled, where we were joined by the New York City Council's Jewish Caucus and the Black Latino Asian Caucus, united to speak out against hate, bigotry, and bias. Following that, I had the opportunity to visit Anne Marie at the hospital who was stabbed several times and was cursed at with a racial slur. In addition, in Borough Park on 13th Avenue and 46th Street, where a Jewish individual was severely beaten on the streets in the morning walking to prayers. We need to put an end to what the motives are to these hate crimes and do a better job in educating the public and also determining the motives of reasons why these hate crimes occur. So today, um, I'm proud to sponsor this bill with my colleague and chair, Donovan Richards, as well as my colleague, Mark Levine, who has an additional bill 
to provide an office uh, of hate crimes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, righty, you may begin. Uh, uh, also, we've been joined by council members Justin Brennan and also Fernando Cabrera. All righty, and we will start uh, with uh, hearing from the first panel, uh, Executive Director Oleg, uh, Deputy Inspector Mark Melinari, and Deputy Commissioner on Human Rights, Dana Sussman. And do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to this committee and answer all questions to the best of your ability? Yes. You may begin. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, Chair Richards and members of the Council. I am Deputy Inspector Mark Molinari, the Commanding Officer of the New York City Police Department's Hate Crime Task Force. I am joined here today by Oleg Chernovsky, the Department's Executive Director of Legislative Affairs. On behalf of the Police Commissioner, James P. O'Neill, we are pleased to testify before your committee about how the Department investigates and works to prevent hate crimes in our city. Whether it is a heartbreaking and senseless murder of Timothy Kaufman, the indiscriminate spray painting of swastikas on synagogues, or the unprovoked attack on Hussein Elbaz, one thing is clear. Weak and callous individuals are attempting to breed fear and divisiveness. It has, however, been heartening to watch the reactions of New Yorkers in the wake of these heinous attacks. The Council is also led in its response to those who seek to promote hate. It was encouraging to watch so many members stand with the Jewish caucus after the horrible attacks in Pittsburgh, and the Black, Latino, and Asian caucus after hate mongers defiled the African Burial Ground Monument, the final resting place for some 15,000 Africans, individuals cruelly torn from their homes for a life of involuntary servitude. Time and time again, the people of this city have not permitted New York to fall into the dark darkness of hate and division. This city honors those historically persecuted for their race, origin, beliefs, and identities, and at its core, the department exists to protect and serve every individual and community, especially the most vulnerable. I think we could all agree that an attack on a member of a particular community targeted because of their race, religion, nationality, gender, or sexual orientation is an attack on all New Yorkers. New York City is the world's epicenter of diversity and stands as an example of how distinct cultures, religions, and nationalities can exist side by side, learning from one another, enriching each other. One of the core pillars of our city's strength is the kaleidoscope of people who call this city home. Hate and intolerance have no place in our society, and attacks premised on hate and intolerance weigh on the collective consciousness of not only the targeted community, but the entirety of the New York community. Through November 11th of this year, there have been 308 confirmed hate crimes, hate crime incidents in the city, which is slightly more than 303 hate crime incidents recorded through November 11th of last year. While we have seen marked decreases in hate crimes in certain categories during this period as compared to last year, we've also seen significant increases in others. For example, hate crimes motivated by gender, ethnicity, religion generally, and Muslim religion in particular are down 36%, 40%, 33%, and 53% respectively. However, anti-black, anti-white, and anti-Semitic hate crimes are up 27%, 88%, and 18% respectively. I want to assure you that the NYPD has zero tolerance for these vile and despicable acts. While our collective message of tolerance may not be, may not be able to win over the hearts and minds of bigots and racists, we can work tirelessly to ensure those who commit crime motivated by hate are apprehended and brought to justice. The Department created the Hate Crimes Task Force in order to thoroughly investigate such crimes and to ensure the apprehension of such perpetrators. The largest such unit in the nation, the Hate Crimes Task Force, consists of 18 detectives, two sergeants, one lieutenant, a captain, and myself, for a total of 23 sworn officers who are specially trained to identify and investigate hate-based crime. Although we can agree that certain rhetoric is disturbing and offensive, such rhetoric may not always rise to the level of criminal activity. The Hate Crimes Task Force reviews every hate crime reported to the Department. If a hate crime is established, the Hate Crimes Task Force takes over the investigation and has the ability to mobilize any and all of the Department resources, including specialized units, to apprehend the perpetrators of these particularly heinous crimes. The Hate Crime Task Force routinely mobilizes precinct detectives, TARU, Computer Crime Squad, Intelligence Bureau, and the Community Affairs Bureau to assist in our investigations. 
By combining our experience and expertise and the skills and knowledge of these bureaus and specialized units, we are able to make more effective identifications, expeditious apprehensions, and build stronger cases for prosecution, thereby ensuring real consequences for those committing these offenses. At all levels, the Department is working diligently to develop stronger relationships with members of the city's diverse communities through the impl implementation of our neighborhood policing philosophy, the work of our neighborhood coordination officers, and sector cops, our build the block meetings, community council meetings, clergy roundtables, and regular meetings with advocates, to just name a few, we are building unprecedented levels of trust with those we serve. This enables us to work with communities in the wake of such incidents to quickly obtain relevant information and allow our community partners to meaningfully assist our investigation. The Hate Crime Task Force also works closely with other NYPD bureaus and members of the community in furtherance of crime prevention. We continuously discuss incidents with precinct commanders so that they can appropriately deploy patrol resources and provide extra protections at religious institutions and other sensitive locations. Whenever there is a high profile incident, such as the Pittsburgh shooting, the NYPD goes on high alert, significantly increasing its visibility and in many cases customizing its deployment plan to discourage potential copycats and increase safety. We also brief community members and council members immediately after such high profile incidents to ensure our communities are aware that even though an incident did not happen in New York City, the department is implementing a plan and taking action to ensure their safety as well as to address any security concerns that may be raised. I'd like to conclude by encouraging members of the public to report to the department or to the New York City Commission on Human Rights whenever they are the victim of a hate crime or discrimination so that the city can properly investigate and mitigate these instances. We look forward to partnering with, this, with the council to get us to the day where a hate crime task force is no longer needed to exist. Thank you for inviting us here to testify today and we are now happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, human rights. No testimony? No testimony, okay. we're here to answer questions if you have them. Okay, awesome, all righty. So can we um, start with, so cases are generally preferred by patrol or precinct detective to the task force, or how does that, can you just walk me through how that works? Sure, generally you are correct, yes. Uh, if when a police officer comes in contact with a member of the community through any means, uh, 911 calls or the NCO program, um, when that member of the community reports to the police they're the victim of a crime and it could be of a possibly biased nature, department protocol uh, ensures that they notify a supervisor, a sergeant or a lieutenant, who then investigates the circumstances and brings it to the attention of an executive, a captain or higher assigned to the precinct or the borough. And once it gets to that level, the uh, captain assesses the circumstances and if it's a, uh, he deems it to be a possibly biased incident, we are notified right directly to the hate crime task force uh, we continue our work from there, which I can get into, or if uh, he deems it to not be a bias incident, we still get notified by that patrol executive about the incident that happened. And how many cases uh, would you say each investigator handles on average? Well, on given average that? this year, um, I believe we read about 23. So 23, and that's adequate staffing in your opinion, or being that we're seeing it in, well, we've seen some slight decreases, but increases in certain areas, has that warranted any need for additional staffing? It has not warranted. We, we are adequately staffed right now. We uh, do have the ability to reach out and get more staff internally into the office if we need more, but we also have all those support units that I mentioned, all the uh, precinct detectives and, and other units, uh, TARU, the, the list that I went through, that if we need resources to help us in our investigation, we have complete access to the department. And you just announced the restructuring of uh, the hate crimes task force from being under uh, the SVD unit now uh, under, I guess you could speak to that change. Uh, what warranted that change? Sure, uh, council member. The, it was the top to bottom review that was announced when the chief of detectives took office uh, earlier this year. He announced that he was gonna do a top to bottom review of not only SVD, but the whole bureau as a whole, and uh, the restructuring was part of that. Okay, so nothing specifically eye-popping, just a, uh, a restructuring of that division? Sure. Okay, and uh, can you just walk us through what's different now about it being from under SVD, under the SVD unit into the new unit? Uh, previously under SVD, uh, Special Victims Division does um, child abuse and sexual assaults. 
and Hate Crime Task Force was part of that unit. Pulling us out enabled them to just work on those two fields, and it pushed us into a division where we have closer access to our support units. Directly in the division with us is Computer Crimes, Major Case Squad. Uh, further out onto the investigative group, we have Crime Stoppers, Crime Scene, The Lab, uh, many other specialty groups that we have access to. All right, and, and can you just go through how, what standard does the task force use to evaluate whether something is a hate crime opposed to a free speech? Uh, two things. We use the Palman Protocol, which establishes what's a hate crime, dating, dating back to our patrol guide, dating back uh, the, the entry is probably 40 years old. But more importantly, the New York State Penal Law, Article 485, dictates what is a hate crime. So specifically, so can you just run us through some examples? So if someone spray paints a SWAT sticker somewhere, um, or perhaps if someone gets into a fight with someone on the subway and they use a derogatory derogatory term, how would you differentiate if it's reported as a, a hate crime? Okay, we take the information that comes in from the, from the victim of it. We use the parameters of the penal law, uh, Article 485, which to summarize uh, as quickly as I can on it, it's a crime motivated um, substantially or totally by the identity, the 10 protected identity groups of the victim. So we take the incident that happened and apply it to that um, statute. We could also reach out to the legal bureau of the NYPD and the DA's office on what we'll need to further a case and, and where these cases lie based on case law. So now you gave a couple of examples and yes, spraying of a swastika is a hate crime. Uh, spraying of a slur against an identity is a hate crime. Obviously an unmotivated attack on somebody could fall into the hate crime parameters. What we have to look at from there though is was that attack motivated by anything other than the hatred and the uh, discrimination against that identity. Uh, you mentioned an assault also. If there was a incident that uh, preceded the assault or the slurs used, um, a push somewhere or a bumping into on a crowded subway car, a crowded street, the motivation for the attack could be the push and not the identity. Uh, we usually use the example also of like a car accident or a road rage incident. Uh, the two people who are involved in the car accident have some differences. Uh, somebody may express those differences. It may turn into a physical altercation, and somebody may use some gratuitous slurs targeting any identity, but the motivation for that interaction is the car accident and not just the hatred of the identity. And in your uh, opening testimony, you spoke of um, hate crimes uh, certainly being motivated in much different spaces this year. Um, would you say that hate crime is being driven by rhetoric we're hearing from the president of Washington, D.C.? Does the NYPD have any idea why we're seeing this surge in uh, hate crimes different in different categories this year? There is the surge in hate crimes this year. The numbers that were discussed, we are up slightly uh, in overall hate crimes. We are down significantly in some categories of hate crimes, some identities, and we are up in other identities. Um, Can you speak to the ones you're down? in, by the way, as well, because I know you mentioned that. Again. Sure. I gave a short list in the opening, uh, in the opening statements, but we are down in most of our categories that, that we track. Um, and the ones we are up in, we're up slightly in some categories and, and larger uh, increases in, in other categories. But in order of uh, grouping them into what's motivating an increase across the board in, uh, in hate crimes and a decrease in some and an increase in others, uh, we can't target exactly what would cause certain affiliations or certain identities to be targeted more or less than they previously were. So you don't, you're not taking an official stance on if there's a correlation between the rhetoric that we hear from the president and folks in Washington, D.C. and a lot of these hate groups who are propping up like the Proud Boys, um, you're not seeing a correlation between that and the increases? Not, no, no, I don't have a stand on a, a direct correlation between the two. So you're not, okay, so you're not officially saying there's a correlation? Correct. Okay. Um, let's go through, so there's been a lot of talk around arming individuals in houses of worship. What is the NYPD's um, stance on that? Or what strategies uh, would you suggest uh, houses of worship, synagogues, mosques, churches uh, use, or have you, thinking about different strategies to ensure that houses of worship feel safe across the city? 
in light of the Tree of Synagogue massacres? So um, the, uh, I think the commissioner has spoken out about uh, <laughs> this topic, whether it be after a uh, school shooting that happened somewhere in the country or one of the, uh, the type of incidents that happened in Pittsburgh, that we have uh, the largest police department in the nation. We have 36,000 armed officers, sworn police officers, and that we should be tasked with the job of policing and it should not be outsourced to individuals carrying guns. Uh, I think the less guns, uh, the better in this sense. I think what the message that we would like to get across and the message that we put out as often as we possibly can is that we have a service, a free service, it's not a service for charge, that we provide to houses of worship um, and other facilities that can request a security survey of their particular facility. We, through our crime prevention unit, will send crime prevention officers to that location. They're going to do a top to bottom assessment that includes uh, window glazing and glass, video surveillance, security lighting, personal safety, alarms, intrusion detective devices, mechanical and electrical locking systems, um, just to name a few, that we will have these individuals that are specially trained go through a location uh, and create a report for, for the house of worship or whichever the facility is. Um, and hopefully they're going to implement the recommendations that we offer. This is, again, I'm going to repeat, it's free of charge and it's upon request. So whenever we can through our com uh, clergy roundtables, the community forums, we get the, the information out that this is something that we offer and we strongly recommend that uh, locations that feel vulnerable uh, take us up on that offer. And I agree with that, that more guns is not necessarily the answer, but what do we tell community members who are rightfully afraid of what uh, could happen given the circumstances in Pittsburgh? And, um, you know, so one of the other things I, I've heard is that the NYP also, so in, I know you spoke of the, the crime prevention unit. How many people are in that unit? Uh, I'll have to get back to you. I don't know. Okay, exactly. because I have heard from uh, Houses of Worship that there's a backlog in those asks, partly because I think local precincts may not have more than one crime prevention officer, perhaps, so that may be an area we can look at. And, and then there's also another program, I don't know if you could speak to it, on where I believe off-duty officers, um, and I know it's a paid service, I think. Sure through the NYPD that Houses of Worship could pay for? Sure, the paid detail program is uh, off-duty officers. Uh, companies or, or locations, for example, Houses of Worship can uh, apply to have an off-duty police officer provide security. Uh, it's, uh, I can give you more information on that program that you can distribute to your constituents, but yeah, that, that is available. And uh, are these officers in uniform? Yes. Okay. Um, and what is the availability of these particular officers? How many? So how does that work? Is an officer request to be a part of the program? Are so yeah, officers would obviously. It's not mandatory. Officers would request to be part of the program, and uh, locations would apply to have an officer station there. Um, I don't believe bars or locations that serve alcohol can apply for this service, but a house of worship could be a good example or a bank uh, can apply for this type of a service and uh, it's done through the department. There's a paid detail office that will review the application um, and assign an officer if it's approved. And is the NYPD taking a stance? I, I, have you seen much more of an increase um, in applications over the course of the last month or so? I, I'm not aware, I can't tell you, uh, but I, I could definitely look into that and get back to you. Okay, because I've heard that there are backlogs, and so I'm just interested in knowing a little bit more about um, that specific uh, process. I'm just gonna go into a few details and turn over to my colleagues for questions. Um, so I know you're familiar with the Proud Boys, um, and in your testimony, you spoke of if a hate crime is established, the Hate Crimes Task Force takes over the investigation and has the ability to mobilize any and all the department's resources, including specialized units to apprehend the perpetrators of these particularly heinous crimes. Um, can you go into where we at um, with arrest, 
Um, have we arrested all of the individuals who were responsible um, for that particular incident? Uh, and if you can't go into specifics, I certainly can understand if there's an ongoing investigation, but I think the public does have a right to know to a great degree what are your protocols moving forward uh, with hate groups coming into our city and deciding that they're gonna wreak havoc uh, on our streets. Sure, so uh, in terms of the investigation, you, you're correct, it is still ongoing. There have been a significant number of arrests made in that case, but there are still uh, individuals outstanding, so I really wouldn't want to comment on that case uh, to, uh, at the risk of jeopardizing it. In terms of hate groups, um, we, we monitor we monitor a large number of these hate groups through our partnerships with our other state and federal partners. Through our Century program, we have partnerships with over 500 um, uh, law enforcement partners around the country uh, uh, where we share information with one another, uh, where these other law enforcement or uh, other law enforcement agencies throughout the country can provide us with information on hate groups operating out of their jurisdiction, and we can provide them with information that we have as well. Through our um, SHIELD program, we partner with uh, over 19,500 private companies uh, that to include uh, houses of worship uh, that we share information that we gather from our Century partners and information that we gather on our own. We share that information in order to better secure uh, the locations and facilities within our city and to offer better protection to our, to our constituents. So in, in that particular event, you are aware they were coming. Um, can you describe the context of uh, the PD's role going into an event? So they were coming here obviously to give a speech uh, at the Republican Club. Can you go into what was your role at that specific place and what role would you play if sure. a hate so group is coming in? I think in that, particular, in that particular case, there was a First Amendment event scheduled at that location. We provided police resources uh, to be present at that location. Um, there were no violations at that particular spot However, when the, one of the crowds dispersed and were being led away, uh, the opposing group circled around the block and the tail end of the group being dispersed uh, wound up meeting up with the group that was circling around and they had an altercation. Our response was relatively quick. Of course, we were policing the event at the location where the event was happening. However, the incident that has been widely publicized didn't happen in that particular location. Our response, we were there within a minute, uh, under a minute, and uh, as soon as the officers were observed, the individuals that were violating the law scattered, and we've been developing cases, collecting video, um, and developing cases on all of those that had uh, that had run away from that location and we have made several apprehensions. And was there a sense even with the conclusion of that event that there may be a problem arising outside that you were aware of or no? Well, the, as a, again, the, the individuals were being led away and there were a group towards the back of that crowd that broke away and there was a group that was present counter-protesting that wound up going in a different direction and they met up off-site. So th that was the way that particular event unraveled. Looking back at that event, and I know the mayor certainly alluded to the fact that things c should have and could have gone better. Uh, are there any new protocols you can speak to? Because something evidently went wrong there. And I just wanna make sure that we don't sweep it under the rug sure. and that we are strategically going to ensure that an incident like this doesn't happen in the future and that arrests don't happen nearly a week later after an incident like that. So can you look, looking back, what are some of the things uh, that the NYPD uh, looking to do, what are you looking to do better uh, moving forward to ensure an incident like that doesn't happen again? 
Well, I think, I, I mean, in terms of, in terms of the arrests happening a, a, a week later, as you said, um, I think in, we had a unique set of circumstances in this case that we didn't have any complainants coming forward and complaining of a crime. So we had to actually investigate this particular incident in, in an unusual way, in the sense that we started gathering video, uh, going door to door, knocking on buildings that had potentially had surveillance, uh, that had cameras, and reviewing those cameras, trying to identify not only potential victims that we could approach and get the victim to make a complaint, but also to identify crimes that didn't need a victim to make a complaint. So that was the, the lag in time. So that was the unusual nature of this particular incident. Ultimately, what happened was we did gather enough, sir, enough video that we were able to make out crimes that we were able to start to start making apprehensions. And that was the hate crimes task force. Did they investigate or who? No, the hate crimes task force was on standby for that incident. But ultimately, that was not a hate crimes case. That was a, a regular case. And what role would they play, knowing that a hate group is coming into the city? Uh, what role would they play, knowing that? Um, well, the Hate Crimes Task Force, and the inspector could correct me if I'm wrong, the Hate Crimes Task Force would be investigating a hate crime after it happens. So no pre-work? So well, the pre-work we have... Was the pre-work we have done through other units within within the department, through our intelligence bureau, that partners, as again I mentioned, the Century and the Shield program, partnering with with law enforcement agency and private partners outside of the city um, to gather the intelligence on these various groups that may be coming here and uh, and securing the city that way. But that didn't happen in this incident, so I'm just want to make sure well that I mean okay it's it's not that it didn't happen in this incident I mean the the event the clash between the two different groups happened the a particular group coming into the city and engaging in in speech however offensive it may be uh, would not be a crime in itself would not be something that the department would stop but uh, when what you actually had happened there was that two opposing groups clashed, not at the site where the protest happened, where we had police officers and police resources, but off-site. So that, that was the unique nature mm -hmm. of this particular incident. Mm -hmm. And uh, are hate crime charges being considered in this, or uh, could you speak to that? At this point. Uh, as of now, uh, as Oleg said, we were a, a support unit to that. We did assist in the investigation, but it was handled by the Precinct Detective Squad. Uh, as of right now, on the information we have, uh, they are not being processed as hate crime charges. It's still an ongoing investigation. Okay. Um, last question, and I'm going to circle back at the, towards the end. Um, so there was an incident, I believe, on a train that um, a few weeks ago back in Brooklyn, I think Hayam certainly spoke on that a, a second ago. Uh, are we look is the hate crime task force investigating that incident? Absolutely, the 70th precinct, uh, a female was stabbed on the, on the train. She was assaulted and later discovered that she was stabbed. We are actively working on that case. We have a sketch that went out. Uh, I don't have it with me. I so a hate crimes I unit is now investigating that? I believe we always were. I don't think there was a okay. flag on that. That came direct to us. Okay, okay. All right, I'm going to go to, before I go to Chaim Deutsch for questions, I'm going to want to acknowledge we've been joined by council members Keith Powers, Paul Vallone, Carlos Menchaca, Udonis Rodriguez, and Danique Miller. Council Member Deutsch. Thank you, Chair. Uh, firstly, I just want to start off by saying uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Inspector. You've been really accessible, and I know, like, really, literally 24 hours a day, whenever you call, you answer your phone. I hear your kids in the background sometimes, and then I hear your colleagues at work in the background, so I always get an idea where you are. But you always answer your phone, so thank you for always being accessible. Um, so my first question is, today we're hear, uh, hearing on two bills. Number one is intro number 1234 by my colleague, Council Member Mark Levine, a local law to amend New York City Charter in relation to creating an office for the prevention of hate crimes. And the second bill is intro number something. Um, that's um, uh, sponsored by uh, me and uh, uh, Councilmember Richards. Do you support these two bills? 
I think, Council Member, at this point, where the administration's reviewing the bills. I, we're certainly supportive of the goals of the bills and what the bills are trying to achieve, and uh, the administration's actively reviewing the legislation to formulate a position. Okay, um, so uh, in the testimony that uh, the Deputy Inspector, um, uh, the, the testimony, I, I don't see anything mentioned in testimony about education outreach. Uh, you speak about investigation, you talk about how many offices you have, um, but there's nothing in there about uh, doing education outreach. Um, do you currently have anyone like on a constant basis doing education outreach? So we, through our crime prevention uh, unit and crime prevention officers, we do go out, uh, whether it's houses of worship or upon request, really, it's not limited to houses of worship, and we provide best practices. It's not only the security surveys, the formal security surveys, but oftentimes uh, we're asked to come and speak to uh, a gathering, a uh, congregation, and we, we send these crime prevention officers to, to that location. Uh, they'll speak to the gathering, whatever it may be, and talk about best practices on security, how to be more vigilant, what to look out for to be more safe. So in that sense, yes. Um, so in the testimony, it was mentioned uh, 23 sworn officers who are specifically trained to identify and investigate hate-based crimes. Um, so the crime prevention officers that are in in a precinct, they're not trained in regards to that. Um, so we have 300 hate, hate crimes uh, so far in 2018. And I think that where we need to start is to educate and do outreach to the public and to figure out, um, let people know that, for example, if someone um, draws a, uh, scrolls a swastika, um, do people know what the meaning of a swastika is? Do people know how it affects a Holocaust survivor? Do people know how it affects a community? Do people know how it terrorizes a community? And this is the education outreach, which is important, like I mentioned, that uh, New Yorkers represent um, uh, from, uh, New Yorkers are from, uh, represent 150 different countries, speak over 80 languages, there's many cultures and, and, and people you know, from different ethnic backgrounds. We need to understand each other's culture, number one, and we also need to understand what a hate crime, what it does to someone. When someone uh, puts in a racial slur on, a, on the African burial, does that individual know what he or she wrote, what he or she scrolled on the burial? So doing the education is not just to be um, proactive, like if you see something, say something, but just to understand um, what, the, what a hate crime, what a, what, a, what a swat sticker means, the meaning of a racial slur. Do you have anything in the crime prevention unit that does that? Yeah. All right, uh, council member, if I may just uh, jump in. Um, as your bill points out, and as Oleg mentioned here, that we do support the uh, purpose of, of the bill. We do support education and, and getting this uh, horrendous no nature to stop. Um, in the Hate Crime Task Force, dare I use the word reactionary, but the investigators there are investigators of crimes that have already occurred. At my level of the Hate Crime Task Force, luckily I get to do a little more of the reach at, uh, outreach. I work with various department units, crime prevention, community affairs, and they schedule presentations to educate the community on what a hate crime is. I work with other city agencies, state agencies, and federal agencies to educate communities on what hate crimes are, how to protect themselves, uh, how to identify them, and, and how to report such incidents. I also do trainings. Um, I do train some of the crime prevention officers. I do uh, trainings on all the supervisory ranks when they get promoted, the detective investigator course, and uh, executive development to teach what a hate crime is. So we do it on, on my end, uh, being the executive, being the commanding officer, I get to do some of that preemptive work that I enjoy doing so much, and I do presentations for many communities that uh, if uh, somebody's having an event and they would like me to speak at it, I get my department authorizations to do it, and I will present to whatever grouping is, is having that. As far as the members of the Hate Crime Task Force, they're there doing the uh, boots on the ground work horrifically after event. 
So do you believe that we could do a better job by having uh, more people going out to schools, uh, to community centers, and just to talk about, um, uh, just to do educational outreach on hate crimes? You know, well, Council Member, I think, uh, as we said, I think the goal of the legislation, getting the word out and speaking to, to the impact of hate-based crimes and the, and the fear and that, that it instills in communities and individuals, that's a good thing. And, and so you support that? Well, as an idea, of course we support it. I, okay. if, I, if I may just add from the Commission on Human Rights perspective, we are also engaging in education and outreach. We have a community outreach team in all five boroughs. Um, that works with schools, houses of worship, community-based organizations, our sister agencies to discuss issues of discrimination and harassment, whether it be in response to trends of hate crimes um, or whether it be a proactive um, community engagement so that um, folks know that the city is supporting them, that we have resources available to them, and that if they choose to come to us as a civil enforcement agency or report to the NYPD, that we, um, we are there, we speak their language, we uh, represent the community, and so um, we're, we're also engaging in that outreach and education as well in partnership with the NYPD. Can you tell me, like in uh, Brooklyn South, how many, um, how many events did you go to that you did education outreach on hate crimes? I cannot um, tell you specifically. I don't have sort of uh, neighborhood breakdowns today, but I can certainly get that information back to you. Thinking more, more than a dozen? Um, in, in a, in a I, can't, I cannot say. Um, I know that we have, we have our Brooklyn office um, that's not located in Brooklyn South, but that is present throughout Brooklyn. Um, and we have responded to um, 68 incidents of, um, of hate crimes that were based on religion um, in the past year, um, the majority of which were anti-Semitic, and the second um, most frequent was anti-Muslim. OK, um, we'll get back to that in a second. Um, I just want to touch upon uh, you did mention that you have a crime prevention, uh, trained crime prevention unit to conduct security assessments at House of Worships. Um, they go out and they do assessments at the House of Worships and they determine if, you know, you let them know what they need to do in order to uh, better secure their premises. So uh, um, you know there's a federal and state grant from Homeland Security that go to House of Worships. Um, and there are many House of Worships who received already the funding back in 2016, and uh, some of the money goes, I mean, all the money, all the funding goes for hardware, indoor hardware and outdoor hardware, which includes ballads. Um, I have not seen too many uh, House of Worships that have these ballads installed outside. Uh, because there's a whole process, you have to go, you have to hire an architect, you have to go through DOB, uh, this is all after the assessment. Um, and I was just alerted that people are sitting on this funding and they actually cannot do anything with it. So I just set up a meeting for um, two weeks now after Thanksgiving uh, to bring together the NYPD, DOB, and DOT to try to streamline this process. But this has been, it's been sitting, they've been sitting on the funding since already for a few years without anything being done and the funding is there. Uh, are you aware of that the funding, that people receive the funding and it's just sitting there and nothing's being done? I mean, I'm aware that this funding exists, but I'm not really, it's not administered through the NYPD. Uh, I think it's administered federally, so I'm, I'm, I really can't speak to that. Okay, so I'm looking forward to working with you to um, uh, work together with the other agencies to see if we could um, push this process to move this way we get the, the, the right protection for the house of worships uh, in the city um, so going back to going back to um, um, the hate crimes issue um, so you mentioned there, there are 308 hate crimes uh, in 2018 do you know the motives for each hate crime is that information that you would have the identity uh that's targeted? The, the motive, in other words, is it a person who is emotionally disturbed who committed the hate crime? Is it an individual who just may not know what a SWAT sticker means, the meaning of a SWAT sticker? Is it someone that has hate in his or her blood? So the motive behind why, why the hate crime was done 
do you, you know, because now everything is a number, 308, right? And, but we don't know the motive of why each hate crime was done. For example, um, I know you had several arrests uh, recently, and uh, the incident in Williamsburg, there was an arrest made. So what was the reason for that pipe being thrown through the window of the synagogue, right? And I know the answer you speak about. I don't have a breakdown of uh, the motivating factors on why perpetrators commit the crimes. We don't, uh, that would have to come from the perpetrator themselves, and we would have to track all those incidents, and we don't, we don't have that breakdown. Uh -huh. But that's something that the NYPD would have? I don't the motives? No, I mean, we have motive in the sense of, was it uh, an anti-Semitic? Was it anti-Asian? Was it anti-black? You know, those are the motivating factors that make out the crime, and therefore those are the ones that we track. So the incident in Crown Heights where a, a Jewish individual was hit with a, um, a branch, right? So I was told, that what I heard, what I read in the news is that the person was emotionally disturbed, right? It wasn't a hate crime, right? We, we put, uh, we arrested him for hate crime charges. But he, he, was, he was charged with a hate crime? By our office, yes, I'd have to, I, I don't but, have the information. But after this, we're turning it out. I so that's probably because, um, I, think they, I think they mentioned he was emotional, emotional disturbed. So I think it's important to figure out what these motives are from the 308 and, going, and moving forward. So this way, we as a city, we know what better resources to put in. If someone is emotional disturbed, we need to put in mental health resources um, for these individuals and for others. And if it's, um, if it's someone who really, it's a youth that doesn't understand what that slur means and just writes something because he or she may have seen that slur some, uh, written someplace else or seen it someplace else, then we need to you know, bring more education to these young adults or to anyone um, whose motive is because they may be uneducated about what, what is a racial slur and what the meaning is because many times you have someone scrolling a swastika and it's backwards. So we know the person knows what a swastika may be, but doesn't know exactly how to draw it. And it's just someone who's not educated about the meaning of what it, what, what it means. Um, so I think it's important that we do know each motive. So this way we, uh, as a city, we know what resources to put in. And that's why it's important to also do education to teach people, because I, I, I see that between um, the NYPD and um, what, what office are you from? The New York City Commission on Human Rights. Okay, and between, uh, between other agencies, there's not enough outreach being done. This should be a regular curriculum uh, going around to schools, uh, speaking at centers, you know, just constantly to do educational outreach, and hopefully through that, people would better understand what um, what they may intend to do that they won't they won't do that. Um, so I think I'm done for now, but I'm glad that you support the uh, the idea of it, and I think it's really important. And um, and once again, I just want to say um, thank you, Inspector. Thank you, Oleg, for always being available. And uh, I'm hoping that, um, that the education outreach um, part of the bill passes because um, I think it's a step in the right direction. Um, we can only do better. We can only, we can only do better than going backwards. We need to move forwards, forward on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Deutsch. We're going to go to Councilmember Lanceman, followed by Lanceman, Councilmember Levine. Good afternoon. Um, first, I want to thank Chair Richards for leading this hearing on preventing hate crimes in New York. Um, look, <clears throat> what I'm interested in knowing is whether or not the NYPD uh, is treating these white supremacist hate groups as the domestic terrorist organizations that they are. And I am not seeing the level of intensity or organizational resources or focus that we saw, for example, after the 9-11 attacks or um, that is directed towards more, shall I say, traditional terrorism. We all know that hate crimes are on the rise in New York City, in New York State, and across the country. 
And it's particularly tragic that the Jewish community in New York City would be in such a situation that a, a New York Times columnist could credibly write and ask the question, are, are Jews safe in New York? But of course, it's not a problem that is unique to the Jewish community. And I'm concerned that as we hear about the strategies and the technology and the manpower being dispatched to uncover uh, plots of international terrorists like ISIS and Al Qaeda and whoever else from that perspective wants to do harm to New Yorkers, that we do not have that same focus and intensity on domestic terrorists. And that is what these people need to be viewed as. They are not just random individuals with um, uh, awful ideas. Today, it was reported that at least one law enforcement agency in the United States, Clark County in, in Washington State, seems to be of the, uh, under the impression that the FBI has designated the Proud Boys an extremist group, which would mean that they would be subject to much greater scrutiny, uh, concern, and investigative resources. I have to tell you, I was profoundly disappointed in the department after the Proud Boys assault and nobody was arrested on the spot. And quite frankly, and I don't want to relitigate this and I don't want to parse the statements that were issued by the, the department's press office, but there was a period of time when the department was, was more interested in um, uh, obscuring the fact that nobody was arrested and, and, and nothing w apparently was being done about what happened on the streets in the New York until people realized, oh, we better actually um, act on this. And then in terms of the, uh, the administration as a whole, uh, New York State and the federal government have funding streams available for nonprofit institutions um, such as a, a, a synagogue or a, or a, or a um, yeshiva or, or a mosque that if they can justify they um, are exposed to, to, a, to an enhanced uh, threat of, of terrorism, whether it's domestic or international, there's capital grant funding that's available for them. Council Member Levine and I, I don't know if it was last year or two years ago, called on the city to likewise adopt such a program and nothing has, has happened. So I really think it's time for, for New York City to join state and federal governments and provide support to local institutions that right now are scrambling for resources to be able to protect themselves. So first question, what resources um, are, the, are, the, are the department directing towards um, combating white supremacism this alt-right movement as a domestic terror organization? Well, I think, uh, I think your, your point is well taken, but I think we're, we're there in the sense of viewing these groups as domestic terrorists. The units within our intelligence bureau that investigate terrorism, that investigate domestic terrorism, are the same individuals that investigate these hate groups. So we are already viewing these groups as such. And we're dedicating resources, whether it's through our leads unit, which uh, investigates suspicious activity and unusual incidents. Sometimes we'll get a report that somebody suspicious is uh, videotaping around a, mo uh, around a mosque or around a synagogue, and the report will come in. And uh, part of the see, so see something, say something, um, program, uh, complaints will come in or allegations. Uh, let me try. I, I don't doubt that you follow up on, on tips, right? But we know, for example, that the NYD has officers stationed around the globe to work in sync with other law enforcement agencies as we all combat the scourge of international terrorism. Do you also have officers deployed, I don't know, to Portland or to Charlottesville or to other places around the the country, do you, do you regularly liaison with the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center? Yeah, so we, we do have officers deployed uh, around the nation as well, as well as what I was mentioning in response to, I, I think, um, Chair Richard's uh, questions that through our Century program, we partner with over 500 law enforcement partners from around the nation. That's an in intelligence uh, sharing partnership where 
we, they gather intelligence of groups that are operating within their jurisdictions and share that intelligence with us, then we would share intelligence that we gather with them. That is a very effective partnership, and it doesn't end with only Century. It also carries over to the SHIELD program, where we have over 19,500 participants and partners. Let, let me ask you a question. I suspect, I hope, and I believe, because the PD does, I think, a very aggressive job of combating international terrorism, that somewhere in your, in your headquarters there's a list of known ISIS supporters or ISIS sympathizers or people who've expressed an interest in uh, this day and age, ISIS seems almost quaint, but whoever the, the latest group of the day is, uh, you know, go over to Syria and, 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 and wage jihad. Do you have a similar list? Do you know who in New York City are uh, members of the Proud Boys? We, we actively work with both our federal and other state partners and actually track uh, white supremacist groups and other hate groups both around the, na uh, around the nation and internationally. So yes, so we are monitoring. This. Approximately how many white supremacist groups are, are active in New York City in the five boroughs? I mean, th that's not information that I would share sitting at the table here, but if that's a briefing that you want to set up, uh, we can certainly do that with you. Okay. And um, do you, what coordination <clears throat> is there with the FBI on the constitutionally appropriate surveillance and intelligence gathering when it comes to these groups that operate in, in the New York City area? Or, or let me ask it a different way. Maybe, maybe that's a, a hard way for you to answer. I know that there's coordination and task force, the FBI and, and other national law enforcement intelligence agencies to keep track of and identify and, and try to preempt and disrupt uh, international terrorist organizations operating or seeking to, to, to operate in New York City. Can you tell me that there is the same level of attention and focus and coordination when it comes to the uh, the monitoring and preemption of the white supremacist alt-right movement? Sure. I mean, and the task forces that we're a part of with our federal partners aren't just limited. Uh, there are quite a few of these task forces that we're a part of that incorporate our state partners and our federal partners. And as I said, um, we view these hate groups as domestic terrorists. So yes, that bleeds over into our collaboration with our federal partners and how we monitor these groups and how we respond to these groups. So uh, let me ask you this, and this comes from the report. It was in The Guardian, and it's referencing, referencing a memo that came out of Clark County. So I don't know the validity of, of, of what's being said. So let me ask you. The report says, the FBI categorizes the Proud Boys as an extremist group with ties to white nationalism. Are you aware of any such designation from the FBI? No, I'm not aware, no. Would you be the person to be aware of it within the NYPD, or is there someone who, who might know Somebody you may, but, and I'll look into that and get back to you. Can that. you look into oh, that and, and get back to you, get back to me? Sure. All right. Um, and then, you know, you're, you're, you're sitting there. I feel like everybody's ignoring you. I'm so sorry. But I, let me give you an opportunity. It's my second hearing of the day. It's fine with me. <laughs> let me give you an opportunity to be on the spot. Sure. Would you agree that the administration should join the state government and the federal government in providing resources to institutions that are at risk of um, uh, violence and attack because of their race, religion, sexual orientation, et cetera, as those categories are covered in the city human rights law? I, I certainly cannot speak to um, resources for law enforcement. I would uh, readily defer to my colleagues here at the table um, and to the, to the leadership of the NYPD. Um, I can say that you know, the council and the administration have supported our work um, by increasing our resources over the past several years, and we've been able to be more present in communities um, because of that. Um, days of visibility, um, community forums, um, events, uh, programming in schools, and so um, we 
we take that, our mandate, very seriously, and we've been able to expand the work that we've um, done in the past several years because of the support of the council and the administration. Right. Last question, if I may, just back to the, the PD. Is there an individual who is the man or woman who is in charge of the white supremacist desk at the, the Intelligence Bureau or the white supremacist desk at the, at the, the, the counterterrorism division? Sure. Well, it's a, it's a unit. I wouldn't say it's a one individual, but there is a unit that monitors hate groups. I wouldn't call one particular category. I wouldn't distinguish them. Hate groups are hate groups, and uh, we have a unit that monitors these hate groups, yeah. But the, that would be all hate groups, like? Well, I mean, there's, uh, again, it's right. I mean, that's, that's what it would be. Your ISISs, your Proud Boys. Your no, uh, we're talking about domestic. Domestic, yeah, no. we're not international. Is that's a, I'm just trying to understand. Right. That's a separate group. Sure. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go to Councilmember Levine. Thank you, Chair Richards. Thank you to the panel. I want to talk about Intro 1234, which I'm pleased to be the lead sponsor of which would create an office uh, in the administration to directly deal with and coordinate our response to the mounting threat of hate crimes in this city. I don't have to rehash the statistics. I know you've talked about them, but suffice to say that hate crimes are up now 40% since 2016 across a variety of categories. Um, this is a source of alarm for those of us in the council, and I, I know you share that alarm. When the city confronts major challenges like this, we often establish an entity to coordinate amongst the many agencies that are required to work together. This has happened on the mayor's office to combat domestic violence. We established a new office last year, Office of the Civil Justice Coordinator for this purpose. There are even um, less worrisome challenges like the mayor's office of media that have come together to coordinate in this fashion. And um, our legislation would do that now for the threat we confront in hate crimes. And this would be a way to coordinate prevention, awareness, investigation, prosecution, impact on communities, to review the budget requests of all the agencies for programs related to hate crimes, to report on the activities of these various entities, uh, to examine trends, look at areas in the city um, which are more vulnerable to hate crimes, look at the specific security concerns of neighborhoods, of schools, of houses of worship, and to evaluate the effectiveness of our city's response to this crisis, um, to support victims of hate crimes, to look at statistics in, in a deeper way. Uh, I can think offhand of half a dozen agencies or more that we need to be marching lockstep together to challenge, to face the challenge. Department of Education when it comes to um, prevention curriculum, uh, Human Rights Commission, um, the Mayor's Office of the, of the Criminal Justice Coordinator, perhaps ACS for grief counseling, uh, perhaps Department of Sanitation or the Parks Department, which are often charged with removing uh, hate crime graffiti, um, uh, the Mayor's Community Assistance Unit, which is charged with um, building ties between different ethnic and religious groups in this city. So there I just mentioned six or seven. Um, I didn't see in the opening testimony, uh, I don't know if it was, it was Olegi who offered it, but the, uh, the opening, um, sorry, Inspector Molinari, um, I didn't see in your opening testimony uh, your position on this piece of legislation. I'd like to give you a chance to weigh in on that now, um, if you could please. Sure, Council Member. The, okay. the administration is still reviewing the legislation, both pieces of legislation out there. I can tell you we certainly the goals of the legislation are certainly supported, um, that um, th this is a very serious topic that needs to be addressed through innovative ways and to change the conversation, to change the mindset. So the administration is actively reviewing both pieces of legislation to formulate a position. What are the agencies other than the PD that could potentially be involved in uh, whether it's preventing or tracking or responding to this threat? 
Well, I mean, as the the lead investor law enforcement agency in, in the city, um, we would certainly have a role when it comes to hate crimes, of, uh, a, a serious role, um, I guess through education uh, and outreach, there would be other agencies, um, but I think that would be part of the process uh, that the administration is going through in reviewing the legislation. Okay, I just, uh, I, I'm sure you get this, but I want to reiterate that we need to attack this by, um, through education programs that can help prevent hate crimes, that can help promote uh, greater mutual respect amongst communities. Um, that would be the Department of Education. Um, we need to continue the never-ending work of building better relationships between communities of faith uh, and ethnic and religious communities in the city that can often be at odds. Um, that's uh, under the purview of the Human Rights Commission. Um, we need to help communities that have been victims of domestic violence, uh, and that might happen in the form of grief counseling. I could see that being a project for the commu Mayor's Community Affairs Unit. Um, we can go on and on, but uh, a rigorous response, a strategic response, and I would think the most effective response requires multiple entities within the sprawling org chart that is city government to be coordinated, to be working together on budget requests, on reporting, and generally to be um, working out common strategies. Um, and that is the underlying goal of this legislation in creating an office analogous to those that I've mentioned. Um, we would love to continue to talk to you um, at the PD and all the relevant agencies about a way to get to this goal together through this bill. Thank you. Thank you. And thank, thank you. And we also yeah. joined by Councilmember Gibson and Colin. All ready. I'm going to go to Councilmember Miller for questions. Thank you, Chair Richards. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, so I, I have a, a few questions about it and just a follow up to what my colleagues have said and, and what you had mentioned about that generally that, that this unit does not uh, di differentiate or discriminate when it came to, comes to um, investigating various groups um, around hate crimes. And so what I want to talk to you about is, is, is somewhat the staffing of, of the unit. How many people are in the, uh, how, many, how much staff do you have? How many officers and civilians involved in the hate crimes unit? There's 23 uh, uniform members, it's 18 detectives, two sergeants, a lieutenant, a captain, and myself, and we have a civilian who works for us also. And, and one civilian? Uh, women, men, Muslims, Christians, Jews, what, what do, you, do you know? Uh, currently, no. right now, there are no females in. Um, we've had in the past, and they've uh, moved out through promotion or retirement. Um, whenever we recruit, we recruit the, the best candidates for the job. African Americans, any? Um, looking around my office in my head, I'm going to say uh, two or three. Muslims? Three? Approximately. I, I'm, I'm just thinking of the, my people individually. I don't okay. have an exact Do, breakdown. Um, and, and I know that typically what the, the unit does is respond to crimes and and so forth. Are, are there any uh, preventive investigations, surveillances, op, uh, operations that go on within these groups as well, within the unit? Preventive observations by my unit on mm -hmm. particular groups? No. So you only investigate those who may or may not be involved in a particular, in a particular crime? Yes. Not ongoing crime, criminal activities? Well, if they're engaging in ongoing criminal activities and we already have them as perpetrators of a hate crime, then we continue investigating them. Okay. Uh, hopefully so apprehending them before they commit another incident. Oh, absolutely. But as far as pre-incident, no, we, we don't track people who may commit a hate crime. Okay. And um, you said that there was some offline conversation that we could have about a particular group that would not be necessarily pertinent that we had that conversation today, but certainly the committee would be uh, make itself available to have that those conversations as well to, to ensure that um, the resources were being allocated in the proper way that, that, that the committee and the council was satisfied that it was being done equitably 
and that each crime would was was given the the uh, the type of um, consideration that it deserved, and 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 so um, are there data to support the amount of crimes, the, the crimes that took place over the last two years where they took place, and the resources that have gone into the those operations as well? The crime numbers, yes. The locations where they occurred, yes. I can get that to you. The amount of effort that went into the investigation, the amount of work that went into it, I, I don't have a, a number for that. Okay. Some investigations are much lengthier than others, require much more work. Mm -hmm. uh, some are equally heinous and, and not treated any differently, but just a, a, dare I say, easier investigation, a quicker investigation is done to apprehend a, a perpetrator. Okay, and, and, um, and I know that last week's uh, <coughs> the facing of the African burial ground what occurred on, on uh, federal grounds. Uh, did that, because it occurred on the federal grounds, did that prevent the NYPD and specifically the hate crimes unit from being involved and to what level of involvement have, can we see and, and, and have we seen or can we expect any results uh, in the near future? It is an ongoing investigation right now, but I could say we were equally involved. Our partners in the federal government have been fantastic with us. Uh, federal Protective Services, who, who secures the buildings there, have been wonderful to us. I've been on the phone with many of their executives and uh, We've embedded uh, one of my detectives with one of their uh, agents, and, and they're working together on the case. Okay, so, and, and, and we have, you have received the kind of uh, uh, cooperation that would, that you expect to receive from another agency on this particular case here. Oh, absolutely. And it wasn't necessarily uh, someone infringing on someone else's investigation in that way that all um, resources um, had been made available so that we can apprehend those involved in this particular case. Just trying to get to whether or not um, uh, we had access, uh, proper access, because it was on federal properties. I know that in the past it's been a little uh, contentious when it came to that. They are placing no restrictions on our access at all. We are working hand in hand with them to, from the entire process from the reporting deck. Thank you, thank you very much, and look forward to uh, that f further briefing. Thank you. Chair. Thank you, Councilman uh, Miller. Go on to Councilman Cabrera. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. I want to commend you for holding uh, this hearing. Um, and also, I want to commend the NYPD, uh, Inspector Oleg, for the great work that you guys are doing in the Human Rights uh, Commission. I, 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 I come from the counseling field. And I'm always curious to find out the root of the problem rather than just keep clipping as, you know, to the leaves, uh, if I may say, or, or the fruit uh, of the problem. It, have you done, I noticed in the hearing, uh, not the hearing, the press conference that the mayor held November the 7th, he mentioned that half, uh, half of all hate crimes in New York City, uh, more than half, were targeting Jews. And then 40, uh, 40 cases, maybe it's a little higher now since you've gone out to 308, uh, are targeting uh, blacks. So is there, here's a question that I have. Have you done an analysis in all these cases, not just this year, but through the previous years. What are we talking about here? Are we talking about individuals who go rogue on um, their hate? Or are we talking about groups, hate groups, uh, where we find uh, those committing these crimes are getting the ideology and have official membership? I'm just trying to see where are we getting the vast majority of the problems from? Mm -hmm. I, uh, I apologize. Um, <clears throat> looking at the, the crimes we have, uh, I have been in hate crimes task force for about 20 months now, getting in uh, March of last year. 
formerly working in special victims. I've had some liaison work. I've worked on some of their major cases for four and a half years prior to that. Um, I could speak to the last 20 months right now. And other than the gentleman that I mentioned in my opening statement, uh, Mr. Timothy Kaufman was murdered in Midtown Manhattan by a member of an organized hate group from Maryland who came up here if, with the intent purpose of doing exactly what he did. Other than that incident, in my 20 months here, I have not identified a perpetrator who was part of an active hate group. So I know we spent a lot of time today talking about hate groups, so they are fundamentally here in New York City. I know we can talk about the race of the United States and different states. Fundamentally, at the very root, our problem is not stemming because people having memberships into these hate groups, which leads me to the next question. I know everybody always wants the NYPD to do everything. Uh, where, and so now I'm gonna go to the human rights. Uh, you mentioned that, uh, Commissioner, you mentioned that you have sufficient funding. Do you work, because I really believe uh, at the end of the day, uh, we gotta educate our young people because that's where the vast majority of them uh, learn the world view. Uh, are you working with the Board of Education? Uh, is there a part of the curriculum that addresses this, this issue? Sure, we um, work, we're working very closely with the Department of Education on, on different initiatives. Um, we provide human rights, what we call Human Rights 101, um, education for schools. We also have a more robust, a longer term project called peer mediation where we train students to um, de-escalate um, uh, conflict in their schools. It's an eight week program. Um, and, and we also provide, we do workshops on specific issues that the students are requesting. So discrimination on the basis of gender identity, for example, um, with the Gender and Sexuality Alliances at different public schools. Um, and we have most recently, um, with the new chancellor, been working sort of at, at a higher level with the DOE on ways that we can coordinate on, on a whole host of different uh, human rights related issues and curriculum. Um, so we are in many schools currently and we're hoping to further embed ourselves in, um, in DOE schools across the city um, in, the in the next year. So I'm happy to hear, number one, that you had the peer mediation. As a matter of fact, I was in the very first group many, many, many years ago to be a, a train uh, through Columbia University. So I'm very happy that you have kept that going. But you mentioned something, we are in many schools, which tells me we're not in all the schools. What's preventing us to make it part of the curriculum? Because really, at the end of the day, we need something systematic and that is comprehensive, that we know is gonna happen, and then how do we measure, do you have uh, an, uh, instruments that you're using right now to measure, has there been a perception, a change of perception from our young people? I would um, have to defer to the DOE with respect to issues around DOE curriculum specifically. I know we are, we, are, we do a lot of outreach to schools in neighborhoods where we know there's been a particular incident or a series of incidents or trends that we're seeing um, and we also the schools reach out directly to us as well so we're on, on this on the sort of lower school level we are in regular contact with the schools that that reach out to us or that we affirmatively reach out to but as far as sort of a, dis a district wide curriculum initiative I think DOE would be would be able to speak to that best and it may vary school to school I just don't have the information available but we'd be happy to be part of those conversations um, with DOE on ways to integrate human rights, civil rights, um, and you know, respect and dignity for all um, in school curriculum. I see you as the conscience of any commission here in the city, and I'm hoping that uh, there will be a concerted uh, or a concert of voices saying this has to happen. We could, I know it's long term. I know it's not a sexy project uh, for us. That some of us might not even see the results and while we're here in office or while you, you work in your uh, respective uh, uh, positions right now. But we gotta start, so, and you already started. I, I just wanted to cover in all the schools, uh, that is critical, it's critical. And I don't think it should, I know there's a role that NYPD plays, but really it should go down to the public schools and the homes. At the end of the day, it starts with parents 
um, and working maybe through the media, social media, getting the message out, working with the nonprofits uh, to, to making sure that there is a change of perception for those who need a change of perception. So thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate all your work, Mr. Thank Chair. Thank you so much for the thank lot of time. You. A few follow-up questions. Um, Oleg is not gonna like this one. So I know we have the gang database, right? Uh, is there a hater base available anywhere? The NYPD is keeping tabs on haters? Uh, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> it's a serious question. I, I couldn't let you get away without yeah, asking no, that I'm, question. No, I'm chuckling at the name um, of that. that so, but in all seriousness, yeah, we have a gang um, database. You say it's important. It's a critical tool in your fight and in, in engaging and following gangs. And, you know, obviously we have questions around transparency around it. Um, but I'm interested in knowing, sure. is there a hater base? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, groups, the groups are monitored. I, how exactly I'll, I have to take a look at, and I can certainly get back to you, and maybe uh, an issue of... So there's no hater base? No, no, that, that's not what I'm saying. Okay. I mean, I, the, what I'm saying is that they're obviously, we're tracking these groups and individuals affiliated with the groups, uh, what the method is, whether where it's being done through our federal partnerships and through their database, or whether we have something in, independent, I'll I'll look into it and get back to you. But I'll certainly get you an answer on it. And then, uh, so you do follow folks' social media? Are you keeping tabs on their social media as well, or? I mean, open source, uh, open source information is certainly something that's available to, uh, to anyone uh, looking uh, to view what's out there. So yeah, I'm sure that's one of the things. And um, do you conduct hate crime prevention measures via social media? Or no, does the NYPD do that? What do you, what do you mean? Exactly? Hate crime prevention, are there any measures that you take to prevent hate crimes through social media? Are there any, you know, I mean, do you have commercials? Do you have any video? Are you promote, doing any promotions on Under educating people <laughs> on what, <coughs> you know, um, hate crimes are and what uh, the result of a hate crime could be? Um, all right, let me go into a few different aspects of that. Um, no, my, <clears throat> my unit doesn't do any direct social media prevention work. The department does, the department hosts events, uh, unity events, and they spread the message there about tolerance, and that does go out through the department's uh, social media accounts. Uh, we also, <clears throat> apologize, we also do have uh, information um, that we put out, and we work with the elected officials, we work with community groups. When there's an incident, we publicize it. It's in the media, and it's in social media equally to get the message out that this happened. This generates two things. Well, this generates, the biggest thing it generates is community outrage, equal outrage that this is offensive. That usually helps us identifying through tips who the perpetrator of this, per, uh, this crime is. After incident, after arrest, it's equally publicized. And I do love seeing the front page of a newspaper or the front page of a social media site with an apprehension being advertised because I think that it teaches people that even if they have this kind of hate in their hearts and minds, that acting on it is not going to be tolerated in this city, and they're going to be investigated, they're going to be apprehended. Um, so I would just, a friendly suggestion, you know, I think that NYPD is doing very good at these media campaigns, and perhaps this is something you may want to play up. And I'm assuming um, people are under-reporting, right? So can you speak to national trends, um, and do you feel like people are openly reporting hate crimes or is there a level of under-reporting just as we see with sexual violence? Um, if I may, I'm gonna just jump in. Um, the commission issued a report on um, the experiences of discrimination, harassment, and bias incidents faced by Muslim, Arab, South Asian, Jewish, and sick New Yorkers. And the report noted that um, uh, only about a little bit less than 30% of individuals who experienced those um, acts of hate reported anywhere, whether it was the commission, the NYPD, uh, local community-based organization, or house of worship. Um, obviously, that spans, that's about a um, oh, little over 3,000 people were surveyed, and only those specific um, communities that I identified, so it doesn't speak to everyone and everyone's experience, but um, what it's teaching us is that 
there is significant underreporting. I think there is for some people who might be vis who wear visibly religious garb, they might experience things sort of the small dated not small, but the day to day sort of everyday um, uh, injustices and sort of don't see a reason. It's become so normalized for some folks that they don't see a reason to report or that they feel like it's just not going to be worth their time in some circumstances. And I think for us at the commission, it's become a real rallying cry around what we can do to better be a resource to communities so that even if they don't want to move forward with a complaint with us or with the NYPD, they know it's important for us to know what's going on so we can respond. Thank you. And um, let me go into, um, so we didn't speak about the LGBTQ community. Um, how are hate crimes uh, differing from those against religious or ethnic minorities in that class of um, uh, crimes, hate crimes? How, like um, <clears throat> the numbers, the data we have on it, um, the sexual orientation category is right now the number two uh, highest group in, uh, in all hate crimes behind uh, anti-Semitic groups and slightly ahead of anti-black uh, uh, incidents uh, against gender. It's uh, single digits right now, but a lot of our uh, other categories are um, are lower. Um, so uh, right now, the sexual orientation, are uh, we have 41 uh, incidents of anti-sexual orientation hate crime incidents, which is exactly tied with last year's as of year to date at 41. And uh, can you speak of your community outreach um, strategy and then also how do you respond in cases of uh, hate crimes against LGBTQ individuals? Does it differ from the way you would respond in other cases? How do you? Uh, I'll respond simply by saying absolutely not. It, uh, nothing, nothing differs here. Every, every crime is investigated 100%. Every identity is, is worked with 100%. There is no... Uh, so there's no difference in the way you there's respond? There's absolutely no difference in the way we yeah. work. And then on education or re outreach to that particular community. Sure. Yeah. So in, in terms of outreach, human rights is more than welcome to chime in here too as well. Yeah, we have through our uh, liaison program through community affairs, we have uh, individuals that are specifically tasked with liaising with uh, the LGBTQ community, with uh, the Muslim community, Jewish community. So there are a number of individuals within the liaison uh, unit that liaise with these various groups, with advocates within the groups. We stay abreast of what the concerns are, what uh, potentially any fears are, and we address them as quickly as possible. And I, I would also just mention that um, discrimination and harassment against the LGBTQ community has been a um, a huge priority for, for the commission, and I hope that has come across in some of the work that we've done. Um, we've um, done days of visibility after there's been homophobic, there was a recent homophobic attack, in fact, in Williamsburg, um, and the commission was out with the Anti-Violence Project um, on a day of visibility to ensure that, that communities in Williamsburg knew um, that the city was had their back, that we were there um, as a resource, um, and we do that work regularly. Unfortunately, I think the truth of the matter is we're probably doing a day of visibility on these kinds of incidents weekly um, at this point, um, but we are very much um, uh, engaged deeply with LGBTQ community-based organizations like AVP um, and, and many others um, to ensure that people know that they um, can come to us with, and also to hopefully prevent future incidents. And uh, just on some of this too, can you just speak of your interaction with the DA's office? So before you make an, a, a determination to assign a case to the task force, at what point do you involve the DA's office? The and determination, it, um, I'm sorry, uh, the determination on assigning a case to the task force is made by me. Uh, we take cases on it uh, Regardless, or, or not, not in speaking with the DA's office, that determination on what we're going to uh, charge it as on our end is, uh, is what we do. Uh, as the case progresses, we'll reach out to the DA's office, so every borough has a DA's office. Inside every DA's office, there is a hate crimes bureau chief. I'm on a first name basis with all of them, and uh, as Councilman uh, Deutsch had, had mentioned, I'm on the phone with them constantly, 24-7. Uh, we have a great working relationship with them, and as a case progresses, especially more, a more elaborate case or certain other criteria to it, we'll be on the phone with that um, hate crime bureau chief to determine what else should we be doing to really make a rock solid case here. We're not just making uh, what some refer to as jump collars, where uh, let's go out and grab that guy's identified and let's just 
grab them quickly. Sometimes we have to put a little more investigative work or a lot more investigative work into solidifying a good, tight case and work directly with the DA's office with that. We have a great relationship with all of them. And uh, how many arrests, so out of your arrests, let's imagine this year, what is your conviction rate? What is the DA, what is your conviction rate? Do you follow? I, I don't I don't usually follow that I don't have it in front of me I, I could work through the department to get it but we don't usually track that all right we should um, so that's something I look forward that won't beat you up for it today but okay. we should definitely know um, you know what the outcomes of our cases are and I think that that certainly sends a very strong message to the public and those who would uh, want to commit crime, hate crimes that this city has zero tolerance and that goes back to that conversation around the Proud Boys. And, you know, we weren't out there just making rhetorical statements. We have to send a very clear message that in New York City that there's zero tolerance uh, for hate crimes. Um, and I'm not saying the NYPD doesn't do that. Um, but, you know, the lack thereof and arrest in that situation does send a message to those white nationalist groups that it is open season in our city and we want to make sure that we send a very clear message that it's not. Um, um, let me just, uh, last question for me and then we'll, Lance, when we'll close and then we'll go to our, pa our panels. Um, uh, so obviously we know what happened uh, to the synagogues, uh, the, the, the Tree of Life synagogue in Pittsburgh. I'm interested in knowing, did you receive calls from mosque as well? And what, have we done any outreach to them to offer them um, education or security um, yeah. uh, outreach information? So, I mean, we, we work hand in hand with, with the Muslim community, aside from the incident that happened in Pittsburgh on High Holy Days, we augment our patrol plan uh, and to pay special attention to uh, houses of worship. Um, we have liaisons that routinely interact with, uh, w with individuals, with community leaders in the Muslim community, and we partner with them. They, uh, will, they'll come here or we'll go, we'll go there, and we, we exchange information and, uh, and keep them abreast of what's going on. Um, in terms of what happened after the Pittsburgh incident, once we became aware of the incident, we augmented our patrol plan that immediately after the incident, where we designated a uh, patrol car in every precinct to pay um, to, to 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 focus on houses of worship, not only to to synagogues but also churches and mosques as well, mm -hmm. in the particular command, and they were doing routine patrols. Uh, throughout the day, I believe every half hour or hour going by, also regular patrol vehicles were were told to pay special attention to houses of worship and uh, as they were doing their regular patrols. So yes, we, we have uh, routine uh, outreach, routine conversation, and we definitely pay special attention to make sure that all houses of worship are, are secure. Right, and uh, so I want to thank you for that before I turn it over to Councilmember Lanceman for a question. Um, I do want to add, I, I, I certainly did hear that from my local precinct and I'm very grateful for it. Um, you know, but one car, I just want you to know, and I know you mentioned patrols, is definitely not enough in an incident like that. I, I have about 20 synagogues alone in my district, at least, and I'm just counting the Rockaways. I mean, I have about 15, 20 churches about three or four mosques. So one car being dedicated is definitely not enough. I'm, I know it's maybe a resource question, but it may be something we may wanna reevaluate moving forward. Um, you know, sure, because I, I think then we can ease that conversation. If, if people know that, and I'm not saying people don't believe PD is there for them, but I believe if the houses of worship feel more presence perhaps we can sort of try to move past that conversation of, well, should we arm individuals? But it really comes down to a resource question and if houses of worship feel comfortable that the NYPD will be there to respond to a great degree. So I definitely appreciate the work of my local priest and I'll shout them out the 101 for being on the case. But, you know, we did a meeting last week and it's very clear, it's very hard to get around with one car dedicated 
Well, um, I just want to be yeah. clear. Yeah. One car was dedicated right. as its sole right. duty mm -hmm. that night and the days after to visit every house of worship, but every patrol car in the particular precinct, whichever precinct it was citywide, was tasked with paying special attention to every house of worship mm -hmm. in their command. So one car had the specific duty. However, every patrol car that was assigned, that was working that day, was driving by and paying special attention to every house of worship. And I want to move past that. You have the NCO program. Mm -hmm. how, were, how are they interacting with the houses of worship? So that is something I'm not going to critique here, but just something to, be, to think about. Because for synagogues, for instance, they can't answer their phones necessarily sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, on a Saturday, depending on, you know, so, or a mosque, you know, there's different levels of access, right? Sure, so I and just, just, uh, just to add, the NC, you brought up NCOs, the part of the NCO training would be the Crime Prevention Office actually having time within the NCO training program. They have a spe separate module that's dedicated to explaining to NCOs the services that crime prevention provides. So as these NCOs are reaching out and making uh, outreach to the various houses of worship, they know that they can promote this program where these houses of worship can call and have us do a security survey for them. So not only do we do it during the larger clergy meetings and, and larger meetings, but we also have it as one-on-one. -on -one. We try to promote that um, houses of worship and other sensitive locations actually utilize this, um, this service that we provide. All right, so I would just um, say there are some communities that are more insulated than mm -hmm. others, and I think being more proactive in outreach efforts um, to houses of worship around the city is critical in each command. So I think there's some work to be done there. Um, and I think the NCOs are doing, I mean, we're gonna have a hearing on that. I won't tell you they're doing a great job because we got questions, but they're doing good outreach efforts. We can always figure out ways to strengthen that and improve that. So something that uh, we should look at as we move forward. Let me go to Councilmember Lansman, and then we'll begin to hear from our panelists. Thank you. Thanks. I just want to get a little more nuance and flavor of how you decide which groups will get monitored, which individuals, which um, uh, hate groups make the list, and, and, and which don't. Well, I, I certainly I appreciate the question, but that's, that's something that I think we would be talking to you about, uh, not at the table. Well, okay. Would, would those, well, why not? Well, I mean, we certainly don't want to create a roadmap for these groups to augment what their modus operandi is, uh, to skirt the way we potentially would track them, monitor them, or, or recognize them as being any particular group. So uh, we would prefer to leave them guessing as to what our methods are, but we understand uh, the function that the council has as an oversight body, and we would be, we'd welcome a conversation with you off the record, <coughs> to, so we could better answer these questions right. more openly. Right. Could could you tell me, and this might have been asked before, but just could you tell me how many groups in 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 the white supremacist genre are 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 currently being monitored no, that or was, on the list? Yeah, I think that was. My answer to that question was that we should have the conversation mm -hmm. off the record. Okay. All right. Well, I'm interested in having that follow-up conversation sure. with you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We're going to call the first panel, uh, Chelsea uh, Goldinger, LGBT Center, Ahmed Ali, Arab American Family Support Center, Michael Cohen, Assignment uh, Weisenthal Center.
I didn't see a uh, state senator that joined us. Uh, all righty, why don't you come up? Did you fill out a slip? You don't have to, I guess. Why don't you come up, James, State Senator James Sanders? All right, you have a seat. You may have a seat. Have a seat. Sir, you want to come around? You testifying, sir? Yeah. There you go. And uh, let me see. I think I have. Oh. Okay, we'll just go through these four. All righty, you may begin. Hello, my name is Chelsea Goldinger. I'm the government government relations manager at the LGBT Center in Manhattan, commonly referred to as the Center. Um, we are in support of both uh, pieces of proposed legislation, so thank you. I guess neither of those council members are here anymore, and to Councilmember Richards, of course, for uh, convening this hearing. As I think we heard earlier today, um, LGBTQ individuals are some of the top targets from these hate crimes, unfortunately. Um, last week, actually, the FBI released their annual data report. What was most interesting Nationwide, of course, hate crimes have increased 17% according to this report. Um, the number of uh, targets against both the, um, based on sexual orientation as well as gender identity, it's remained relatively constant, unfortunately, with the dramatic increase in the number of hate crimes overall that has actually met an increase in the number of folks targeted within this community. Uh, what's most jarring about our community specifically, and I think this is true from a lot of marginalized communities, is a lot of folks don't come forward and report. I know before we heard about the stats of the transgender and gender non-conforming folks uh, as low as in the single digits. And while that sounds really positive, um, I think what we're alarmed about is that folks are not actually comfortable coming forward to traditional authorities. And so we would love to see the city and the council work on kind of figuring out new ways to reach these communities so that they can come forward. Um, I, can, I wrote about in the testimony I submitted um, and other reports basically that have done work actually asking community directly instead of through police data. Um, the estimates are like five to eight times larger um, than what they estimate based on that community data. Um, I think on the other side of that, the biggest hurdle we also see is a lack of data, uh, understanding the origin of these crimes as well as sort of how they've happened, um, especially within our community. Uh, very often the forums and intake forums involved uh, don't have things like sexual orientation and gender identity, which make it really challenging to combat these problems when we don't know sort of how they manifest. And I did really appreciate the intent of the um, committee and Councilmember George in kind of talking through what is the root of some of these concerns. Um, we'd also, in the last piece, we love the outreach idea. We'd wanna make sure that that includes surveys both before and after to make sure we're actually um, doing the work we intend. Um, and we do have a lot of experience over at the center um, doing a lot of work for affirming providers and we'd be happy to help the city with that. So thank you um, for your time on this issue and we appreciate it. Thank you. Press your uh, button. There we go. Uh, I want to begin by thanking the Committee on Public Safety and to the entire New York City Council for taking the time to understand and respond to the rampant levels of hate crime that uh, unfortunately marginalized communities are facing daily. My name is Ahmed Ali and I'm a program manager at the Arab American Family Support Center where I work with high school aged youth building healthy relationships and leadership workshops. Uh, at the Arab American Family Support Center we've been working to strengthen immigrant and refugee families since 1994 by promoting well-being, preventing violence, and uh, amplifying the voices of marginalized populations. Uh, our organization serves all, but over our nearly 25 years of experience, we've gained the cultural and linguistic competency, serving the growing population of Arab, Middle Eastern, Muslim, Southeast Asian communities. This past May, the Arab American Family Support Center hosted the launch of the New York City Commission on Human Rights Report on Discrimination against vulnerable communities in New York City, leading up to and following the 2016 presidential election. Many of our community members contributed to the findings in this report, sharing their personal experiences as victims of acts of hate and the results are disturbing. 
Nearly 40% of those surveyed reported being victims of physical assault. One in four Muslim women who wear hijabs report being intentionally, intentionally pushed or shoved on subway platform. And unfortunately, nearly 70% of those surveyed said they did not report the crime for fear of retaliation. At the Arab American Family Support Center, our community members regularly share horror stories of mistreatment and visible acts of hate. We recently supported a young woman who was afraid to leave her home after someone on the street forcibly removed her hijab. Another community member experienced vandalism. The tires on his car were deflated and racial slurs were spray painted across the vehicle. Community members tell us that they feel isolated and do not know where to turn in these situations. Many are afraid to report crimes to police or other agencies, fearing that they will not be taken seriously or their immigration status may be called into question. The Arab American Family Support Center is proud to have joined the New York City Commission on Human Rights and a number of other organizations, including Jews for uh, Racial and Economic Justice, the Setu Yatu Center for African Women, the Sea Coalition, and the New York chapter of the Council on American Islamic Relations. We, found, we would be proud to work with you all in supporting victims of hate, creating a community responsive, effective solution to underreporting and ensuring that all New Yorkers know that acts of discrimination and hate will not be tolerated. Thank you for your time. You could finish up if you want to wrap up with so, the yeah. some following steps. Yeah, just some uh, following steps. If you could actively stand with the marginalized communities that are being unfairly targeted and mistreated, and I think the first step is holding meetings like today to accept our support and your motion to create an office for victims of hate, as well as the second part of education. And we would also urge you to consider the cultural and linguistic competency to guarantee accessibility for victims. The Arab American Family Support Center is ready and willing to assist in these efforts. And finally, ensure that community members know that the office for victims of hate will be a safe zone where immigration status will not be questioned. Thank you again. Thank you. Now I hear from State Senator James Sanders. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I want to first acknowledge and thank the Chair for being a forceful advocate on this and so many other issues. Uh, the city is blessed to have really good people at a good time, and we're, I'm sitting before two of the best. Uh, Councilmember Lanceman, of course, you are, have been a leader in this many years, perhaps you saw it coming, perhaps you saw that it could come, and both of you have been doing a yeoman's job on it. Elected officials must lead the way in uh, putting the right climate out, a climate that says we will tolerate, a climate that says that uh, if you are respecting the law of the land, if you are respecting your neighbors, then we will tolerate uh, what you're going. We don't have to believe everything that everyone is saying, but you do have to tolerate. Um, the gold standard, you raised the right question, Council Member uh, Lanceman, when you uh, spoke of the right wing and the city's efforts perhaps in dealing with them. The gold standard in this is the Southern Poverty Law Center and Brene Breath, and both of them are saying that the, there is an incredible rise in this. We saw it in New York where we saw the Proud Boys come down here and bring their brand of madness, and we saw a, at best a lukewarm response from the police department on this issue. Uh, I did notice that the council member Richard spoke out against that. I, uh, you may have, I may not have noticed yours, but you certainly did. With a change of government in Albany, we are really looking to see uh, what the city wants to do. You, you now have a stronger partner uh, in the north, if you wish, uh, that is interested in seeing how we can effectively educate people first and first. We believe that education is the first and best defense of all of these things. Educate and then to separate people uh, from youth throwing uh, uh, bars and things through. That's a type of education and punishment, but an education 
to say, do you know what you've done? Uh, and which is different than what you would do with a group like the Proud Boys, who are very clear and they are existing to wreak havoc, if you wish. So we're looking forward to proposed legislation. We have some ideas of our own, but it, this city issue, city issues need to be put forward by the city, and we need to support that. And I'm here, and, and my presence is to say that. It's good to be on the other side of this table. Thank you very much. I will respect the bell. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Michael Cohen, the East Coast Director of the Simon Wiesenthal Center. The Wiesenthal Center is a global human rights organization confronting anti-Semitism, hate, terrorism, promoting human rights and dignity with a constituency of over 400,000 families, including about 150,000 in the Tri-State area. Mr. Chairman, thank you for providing the Simon Wiesenthal Center an opportunity to address the Committee on Public Safety in support of the proposed laws to establish a New York City Office of, the, of Prevention of Hate Crimes. I also want to thank Council Members Richards, Deutsch, and Levine, and all the co-sponsors for introducing these concepts in combating hate that could be applied to municipalities across the United States. Mr. Chairman, unfortunately, statistics don't lie. Each year, the FBI confirms that African Americans are the number one targets of race-based hate in the, in the United States, and that Jews, by, the, by far, are the number one target of, of religion-based hate. Add that to the 24-7 bigotry online and the specific um, recent massacres, uh, both in Pittsburgh and in South Carolina and Texas, in those respective houses of prayer, our nation, particularly minority communities, have reason to be deeply concerned. As New York City, the gateway of our nation, home to members of every race, creed, color, nationality, that fear, punctuated with the recent hate crimes targeting our communities, proves the needs for, the, for these initiatives being considered by the New York City Council. Unfortunately, the tendency after the headlines from tragedies such as Pittsburgh and South Carolina synagogue, and the synagogue murders in Pittsburgh fade from our front pages. It is to lapse back into inaction bordering on apathy. New Yorkers and their leaders cannot allow that to happen. Just last week, the, the, the Simon Wiesendahl Center proudly stood alongside interfaith clergy with leaders from the Jewish, Christian, and Muslim communities as, as New York State Assemblymember Walter Mosley and New Jersey Assemblymember Gordon Johnson announced that they will work together to introduce legislation that will recognize all houses of worship as a sacred grounds in the eyes of the law, dramatically increasing the penalties for individuals caught carrying unlicensed weapons in or near those facilities, while also ensuring that anyone committing, uh, com anyone committing a hate crime in a house of worship with multiple felony counts attached to it would be mandated to serve their sentences consecutively and not concurrently. Obviously, legislation alone is not a cure-all for hate, but with such initiatives, we will, we will at least have the necessary tools to start fighting back. As was reported, the digital, footprint, the digital footprint of hate that the shooter in Pittsburgh left was enormous. Unfortunately, he is not the only one spewing such venom, and he is unlikely to be the last person to embrace an act upon gen of genocidal hate and anti-Semitism. The Simon Wiesendahl Center's Digital Terrorism and Hate Project has developed and begun to deploy digital hate workshops for high school and middle school students empowering our young people to identify and deal with the tsunami of online hate speech. It is up to us adults, a consortium of concerned citizens, clergy, police, elected officials, and social media giants to work together to thwart this new and growing source of hate and violence. In the, Keep going. In this, thank you. In this spirit, we applaud the council for its actions today. There is no substitute for a government-sponsored entity that can help coordinate faster and more effective responses to hate and better empower all segments of New York City's unparalleled diverse population. We urge the committee and the City Council to support both of these endeavors, and the Simon & Wiesendahl Center stands ready to help wherever possible. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your testimony. And is there anything else we could be doing outside of these pieces of legislation? And this is for anyone on the panel that uh, you believe uh, would make uh, houses of worship, synagogues, mosques, churches, uh, wherever folks worship at, safer. If there's any other recommendations you have, anyone on the panel? Thank you. Or the LGBTQ community too, transgender community. Thank you. Uh, any, uh, you could answer that question. That's a question. Are there anything <laughs> you could do? If there's nothing, so these pieces of legislation are fine. No. And I, is there anything we're missing? I would missing? speak on one thing since we do have the senator in the room. I know we are very interested on the state level in having better hate crimes reporting data. Okay. For our knowledge that doesn't exist. Okay. So. 
food for thought for you. And you feel the NYPD has been dealing adequately with the community based on your interactions with people from your community? We have. It's interesting that there is also a representative, of course, from the Human Rights Commission. We do have a really fantastic and robust uh, emotion, and they are they do Great. a lot of educational and awareness work with us directly. I would say, you know, we sit on the task force with the NYPD to deal with okay. LGBTQ issues. I'm actually our representative on that task force. I think the biggest challenge is that it's frankly the same with any of these communities. It's just that actual comfort level um, with engaging government. So I think, again, if there's any way to figure out a different reporting mechanism that's not directly to the police, I think that goes a huge way and alleviates people's ability to come forward. And Mr. Cohen, um, let me uh, ask you a question. So I just did a meeting with uh, probably about 20 uh, leaders in, in my particular district from different uh, synagogues. And there's sort of a little tension between the question of should we be armed or should we not be armed? Um, what are your thoughts, I think, when it comes to protecting synagogues? Uh, has your organization taken a stance? Do you believe the NYPD's um, recommendation of using crime prevention officers is the, the right way to go? Um, and I know this is a sensitive topic, it's very hard, many layers to it, but is there any specific thing you think we could do to strengthen uh, houses of worship in the city? Oh, well, thank you for the question. And I, one thing I would say is what a, a lot of, I know synagogues are doing, and I assume other houses of worship also, is having, um, is having trainings for their congregants to be able to make sure that they themselves could help, I, I guess, monitor and, and, and watch the doors and, and train of how they can uh, monitor different exits and different entrances and, and who's coming in and out. Um, so that, first of all, uh, any congregant of their own house of worship is going to have a much better sense of who's coming in and out of their own, of their own synagogue or, 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 or whatever other house of worship and know who belongs and who doesn't belong. And I think those kinds of trainings are things that uh, can definitely be expanded and are obviously a, 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 a cost-effective cost way of making sure that there's constant uh, monitoring of, of entrances and, 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 uh, and protection. You know, obviously anything that could um, protect our house of, houses of worship uh, is going to be something that we'd want to look into and, and, uh, and see where that level of comfort is and budgetary aspects are. Uh, but we'd love to work with you on, on any of those kinds of things and whatever we can do to help. Thank you. All righty. Thank you all for your testimony. Oh, you, did you have a question? No, you good? Okay. All right. Thank you all for your testimony. Thank you. All righty. We're on to our last panel now. All righty. Orde Am I reading this? Ordesia Ray? Am I saying it right? From uh, New York City Anti-Violence Project. Alrighty, Brandon Terrell Hicks, representing the National Action Network. Last call, anyone else wish to testify? All right, seeing none, okay, thank you. You may begin. Good afternoon. Um, again, my name is Brandon Hicks. I'm the national organizer with National Action Network. Um, national Action Network fully supports the two pieces of legislation that this committee has put forward. Um, national Action Network is a national civil rights organization founded in 1991 by Reverend Al Sharpton. In May, our crisis director, Reverend Kevin McCall, got a phone call about a noose hanging on a construction site in Queens. And this was the second incident that happened. Uh, a construction site in Manhattan had previously reported having a poster with a person being lynched on the poster. We take these issues very seriously and we think that creating this office will help our crisis director in his efforts to really um, tackle hate crimes in the city. Um, as you know, hate crimes are on the rise in the nation. Um, in the city, there have been 34 anti-black hate crimes reported this year. Um, and the city is on track to have more hate crimes reported this year than we did last year, and we actually had 325 reported. Um, the FBI has said that groups like the Proud Boys are on the rise because of, they haven't drawn a correlation between Trump's hateful rhetoric and 
instances of hate, but we can draw those conclusions ourselves. Um, in Kentucky, the instances of anti-black hatred with two people getting shot in the parking lot of a Kroger, they all have our members across the country really alarmed and wanting cities to take action like that you all have proposed. So again, we are, I don't want to rehash everything that's been said today, but we are full support of this bill, these two pieces of bill legislation, and we um, want to let you know that we're here to support you in any way we can. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you. Let the Rev know I said hello, and oh, Rev McCall, who knew me when I had more hair. <laughs> um, but thank you so much uh, for your testimony today. Thank you. All right, we're going to begin to close out. Uh, I want to thank everyone for coming out today and having a very important conversation, I think a necessary conversation um, for this city in a time where uh, we once again continuously see uh, the rise of hate crimes happening across all categories um, in our city, um, in race and religions, and we need to make sure that we continue to send a very strong message to those who, were, who would perpetuate hate crimes that we have zero tolerance in our city for that. And the way to combat that is for all of us to continue to stand together from all backgrounds, whether we're immigrants, whether we're, you know, whether we're black, white, whether we're Jewish, whether we're Muslim. And the more we stand together, the more uh, I believe we'll start to see those numbers decrease. Uh, if they come for one of us at night, they'll come for the other in the morning. If they come for, and they have come for a church, they have come for a mosque, they have come for a synagogue, and it's incumbent that we stand against anyone who would break down who we are as a nation. So thank you for coming out. I want to thank uh, my senior legislative counsel, Daniel Ades, for his work, and my senior policy analyst, Casey Addison, uh, for their work in getting us uh, through today. And uh, now it is 4.16, and this hearing is now closed. Thank you. <laughs>